Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Great performances, about which we will tell you today with great affection, says it's a company that serves the privileged of New York and cares about the less fortunate. Liz Newmark is its founder, president, and the soul, and I'm delighted to welcome her. Hello. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you. So now I think people want to know what Great Performances is. Well, uh, Great Performances, Artists as Waitresses Incorporated, is a catering company. And we started long ago as a, a waitress service for women in the arts, hence our name, Great Performances. You, were, you wanted to be a photographer after college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, I, I say, I succeeded at the means and failed at the ends. So great performances. It's, it's my great failure in life. Well, it's hardly a failure because it's, an, it's a large corporation, isn't it? It's one of the largest catering companies. Where, where is it? We are probably one of the largest, if not the largest, privately held company. Yeah. But when I think about catering, I never say that we're large. I like to yeah. think that we're very small and, and very intimate. And very personal. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, when I said you were the soul of the company, um, I mean, that's really a very serious and important thing for people to know. But you um, started with the waitressing and then somehow got into catering. And, uh, and of course, we have to tell everybody you catered Jimmy's and mine wedding, uh, which was back in 1982. So it's been a long time. Uh, you started like about 1980? Yep. Food is so important to people, isn't it? I'm not joking. I'm joking. Food is... Uh, it's not only important because we need to eat to survive, but life happens around food. And people ask me, if, you know, if I'm a foodie, I say, no, I'm not a foodie, but I'm all about hospitality. And what happens when people get together, either for a wedding or for a meeting, a celebration, a product launch? Uh, food is always that key element at the table. And at home, even at a dinner table, right? Well, food, you know, it's like, I love you, eat. So right. food is also is, love. Well, your is mother was love. very successful. Mine wasn't so successful because I still have to clear the plates. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, but you also do the quality of food and the presentation of food. I mean, there is a great um, creative part of great performances. Yeah. Well, I think part of it comes be from everybody who's associated with the companies in the arts. So we bring a very special flair with us. But Is that still, that still happens? Absolutely. That's interesting. Oh, we've uh, singers, dancers, actors, writers. Cooking? Uh, less in the kitchen, but on site. After the food's prepared and it comes to a party, they're the ones who are going to arrange it and, and put out the buffet. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why they do it with such... Uh Grace or flair. Fun. Flair, right. Right. So how many cooks for, how many chefs do you have, for instance? Well, I mean, it's very hierarchical. So there's the head chef, you know, the chef to cuisine, Mark Spooner, who's a chopped champion. We were all very excited <laughs> about that. Never watched it before I saw Mark. Oh, that's good. And then there's a series of uh, sous chefs, probably about five or six, uh, in our different venues. Uh, there might be a venue chef. So, for example, at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola, there's a chef there. At Sotheby's, there's a chef. Oh, I see. So you have a contract with somebody, and you use their kitchen. Uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. at, a, at a cafe or a little restaurant. Right. And that provides on an site. ongoing series of meals. Right. And that's a, that's a different kind of business than catering. Right. Uh, and, and then there's probably, on any given day, anywhere from 30 to 45, 50 cooks in the kitchen. So there are how many people in the kitchen? About 60? More? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Who I, knows? I don't like to count them. But you also cater museums. Yeah. And and theater. I mean, Jazz and Lincoln Center. Jazz Lincoln Center. Do they know. have their own kitchens, or do you cater that? We just have a little kitchen at the club. So everything for a special event. You know, we, we're the nomads of the uh, part of the food business. So we roll in, we roll out. So what what did you have to learn to do this? I mean, you started. <laughs> if you start with the photography, and then you start with the waiting. And right. The waiting was with actors and artists who needed to supplement or make some money. Um, and then you get into catering. What did you have to do? Were you a natural cook before? You know, I think what I learned is let the real professionals do the professional's job. There are some people come into this business and they come in through the culinary door. Uh, my door was really through the service end and more the customer experience. So in 82, when we built our first kitchen, just for your wedding, <laughs> uh, we hired a, a chef. And sure, I participate in some of the discussions on a seasonal basis on food, but they really create the menus and the and recipes. They do. I was going to ask who, who decides. Somebody said that you're really on the, you're a visionary when it comes to the presentation of food. 
so that's all from the chefs. It has to be collaborative. Yeah. We know what a customer is going to need. We know what the four walls look like and what the physical limitations are. Uh, but the chefs really know the food part, and right. we, so we work collaboratively. Right. How do the chefs decide what they're going to do next? How do you have a changing cuisine? It's always fascinating me. <sighs> well, <laughs> it, 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 it's very interesting because in catering, unlike in a restaurant, we might have to serve 400 meals in 12 minutes. Mm. Okay? We do that mm -hmm. you know, a couple times mm -hmm. a week, and we don't even think about it. In a restaurant, you're putting out two meals, and then two meals, and then two meals. So our clients go to these restaurants and they see these elaborate, fabulous plates, and they come to us and they want to do something just like they saw at the restaurant. So we adapt it for catering. We see trends on the outside, uh -huh. uh, being in the restaurant world, and we adapt them for catering. Or by now, you know, we have our own uh, vibe. We, of course, are very into what's growing locally, yeah. so we look to that yeah. for inspiration as well. Now, you grow locally. You're the only catering system I read in the country right. that grows locally. Or are the only people really crazy enough <laughs> <laughs> to try to do it? To, to, you know, I mean, yeah, to have so, a farm. So tell us about the farm. Well, it's a Kachki farm. It's 60 acres. It's a NOFA certified organic farm. And we bought the farm in 06, really realizing a, a, a long-term dream about having a farm. And it was before what we say is green being the new black. We just felt, yeah. I felt that we needed to, to um, as the company grew and things become slightly, your relationship with ingredients becomes a little less personal, that we needed to just stop and um, reconnect with just the very, the earth. Mm. Uh, you know, kind mm. of a, a, a crazy idea. Mm. Uh, but we would talk about growing our own vegetables um, and infusing that in, in our food. So you bought the farm. So we bought the farm. <laughs> and it was, it was great because I, you know, nice <laughs> Manhattan, th you know, third generation West Sider yeah. uh, up in the country looking at farmland yeah. and fell in <laughs> love, saw 50, 60 properties, fell in love with this one particular piece because it, uh, it was very diverse. 15 acres of wood, a two acre pond with fish. Every time I walked the lands, frogs would jump around and <laughs> rabbits and I saw a fox and there was like a few little wet spots here and there in the fields, but I thought, okay, you you know, know, you just around drive it. around that. <laughs> and, uh, and we bought this property and the first thing we did once we found our farmer Bob Walker, is we put in 30,000 feet of drainage pipe in the fields oh. <laughs> because it was a little, a little saturated. Yeah. And you know, you've adjusted to all of these things. Did you know you were going to be such a good manager when you started? No. <laughs> <laughs> and each challenge makes, raises the, the resources or something? So, you know, what we do is the ultimate ensemble work. I mean, every day it's like a little bit of, I guess, outward bound. Yeah. And when you're working like this with people day after day, month after month, and, and year after year, because there's a lot of mm -hmm. longevity in the company, um, it really becomes a team. Mm -hmm. And I watch someone else's back, someone else watches my back. We all have our jobs, uh, but we really do come together to That's create. So what kind of, what are you growing there? I mean, you're, are you supplying all your vegetables from the farm? No, no, no. We use everything we grow. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a few mm -hmm. more years of global warming and we'll be growing year round, but right now we still have winter, mm -hmm. thankfully. Mm -hmm. So uh, our first crops will start in late May. We'll get some greens. And then we go through November. We have three greenhouses, so our tomato season starts early, ends early, and we have beautiful microgreens that come from the greenhouse year round. Mm. So it's really a, a full array of Hudson Valley vegetables. Do you, uh, you don't sell at the Union Square market? Not oh, Union Square, but we do green market. Oh, that's Every right, Every Thursday we are at the Port Authority, uh -huh. which has been a whole nother trip because no one thinks of Port Authority. <laughs> as being a place to sell organic right? vegetables. People think of, uh, what's that, Midnight Cowboy? Mm -hmm. um, and then for six weeks we are at Rockefeller Center. Uh. And we also do farmer's market up uh, in Del Mar which is right outside That's Albany. Albany. And you, you have some children's programs. We do, we do. Yes, um, let's talk about that. Well, part of the farm, 
was it, it was from from the get-go was going to have uh, two purposes. One is to grow vegetables, and the other is to house a, an educational center called the Sylvia Center. And children come to the farm, and they plant, they harvest, and then we make a meal with what they're harvesting. So maybe they're going to get eggs from the chickens, and uh, we'll make some vegetable omelet. We make soup. Uh, we make burritos, we make some, t so with, with the burrito, we have children from all different kinds of ethnic backgrounds, so we try to do something that's appropriate. And they learn about nutrition? You know, I don't like the word education, and I don't like the word nutrition, because they sound so, uh, it makes me want to rebel. Right. So we <laughs> talk about inspiring them to eat well and learn the flavors of real food, see where the food comes from. And by doing that, little lights go off and connections are yeah. made. And we hope that we plant a seed in them for that will influence future growing. Do you do that in the city also? We do. do. Now tell us about Sylvia Center. Uh, well, the Sylvia Center in the city, we have a, a little small kitchen. We're probably the only people anywhere with a huge commercial kitchen. And right next door, we have a small children's kitchen. So when you go into the bathrooms, great performances, there's little low sinks <laughs> for our kids. Uh, and That's children okay. are in there every day. And because it's a small kitchen and we can't accommodate classroom size groups, we are also going into some of the public schools. So where do you get the children to come in? How do they find out? Well, the first years, again, before this was even uh, popular, we would call schools. I mean, we literally went down the list and we drew a circle. We said, okay, these are close, let's call them. And now uh, schools find us. And uh, so, other, yeah. other nonprofits, uh, University Settlement is in today. We'll be working with New York Restoration Project. So we partner up with a lot of people. Tell me, you also are very careful about your food that's left over. What right. happens? Well, it's called food rescue. There's, there's two things that are very, we're very uh, passionate about. One is 5% of everything we grow at Kotchke Farm is earmarked for anti-hunger project. So some of it goes to programs up in Columbia County, but the bulk of it comes down here. And the last two years, we're partnering with the Yorkville Common Pantry, and uh, we, they pick up from us, and it goes in the bags that their clients pick up every week, so they're getting fresh vegetables. Do they get prepared food also? Well, that's where the food rescue comes I from. They... If there's leftover, if there's overage from production or from a special event, today we had a, a luncheon for 500 that got canceled. Um, well, you know. What happens? Uh, first of all, they pay. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> um, but the food will go then to, uh, to food rescue. Oh, and that'll go to what? That'll go to Yorkville Common Pantry will come, they'll oh. pick up. Right. Uh, and then they'll give it, they have, they feed people. We skipped over the initial part of how you, when you run the business, we did the kitchen and the waiting. How do you estimate what it's going to cost? Do you do that? Or no, do you no, have specialists? I, I, I don't do math. <laughs> oh, uh, that's right. why I went into catering, but then I realized there's a lot of math yeah, involved. Yeah. Um, we work up the menu and we uh -huh. have a purchaser uh -huh. uh, who works, we, there's a lot of software, so prices are input weekly. Uh, the menu's broken down into components from recipes, and every uh, ingredient has a cost to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. <laughs> it's amazing to me, and I, I always get a little personal on the show because I, I, wa I, un I wanna know what motivates somebody to do this. And so when I said it was your soul, I mean, it's, that's been the basic the spine of the whole business, wasn't it? Your, your concern for actors are your friends, actors and actresses and people in the arts. So that's who you hire, right? It just goes right along. Do you know, I think uh, every company has a culture. Yeah, but some of them are very impersonal. Not ours. Yeah. Not ours. So, you know, we're both also Barnard alums. Right. And I think part of that signature, I was a political studies, urban, mm -hmm. urban political science, urban studies major. and. You know, for a while I thought going into food was a detour, and I realized that it's probably one mm. of the uh, greatest forms of political activism. Uh, because on the surface, food seems like a very neutral topic, but it's, but it's really not, and there are many aspects to it. One is, yes, the people we hire, the men and women on the service staff who are in the arts and supporting the arts and supporting their goals and their dreams, that's one part of it. The other part is the food service industry is an enormous employer mm. nationally, 
and our families, and we have hundreds of families who depend on us for their income, uh, a lot of lower working class families, and that's important uh, and drives me mm -hmm. and, and drives all of us. So, you know, we see that. Um, good food is something we take so for granted. Oh, you know, yet, yet another Whole Foods on the west side, yeah, right. uh, but their neighborhoods a stone's throw that are food deserts. And we're dealing with children who've never seen some, some of these like fresh that. foods that, that you and I, you know, take, take so, so oh, you know, the, the microgreens on our salad. I mean, I don't think they even know the difference between iceberg and romaine, no less six different types of microgreens. So it's a question of justice and equality. Yeah. So you have food to have- justice. It's, but it comes, that comes from inside. I mean, not everybody in their business has a culture like yours. Yeah. Have you found, do you find colleagues in the business or in other businesses that you feel have the same kind of thing? Yeah, I think there's a name for it now and they call it conscious capitalism. Oh, is that right? All right. And that really resonates. Uh, so we say that it's about the journey, not necessarily the end goal, because every day is the day that matters. Um, I think sometimes that I'm probably a very foolish businesswoman because I should be much more focused on bottom line. Um, and my feeling about that is there's people at great performances. Their job is to look at the bottom <laughs> line. Um, my job is to, to, first of all, act on my conscience and create a new kind of model. I think that so much of our, our, our health issues in this country that come from bad food are really driven by these, you know, multinational corporations who it's about bottom line. Mm. So if they're selling the world's worst food in terms of healthfulness and the impact on bodies, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's junk cereals, sodas, fast food, with the horrible meats, um, it's all profit driven. I, 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 yeah. I'm not in that. I'm not yeah. going to be that way. And that, and and of course, we've now recognized as a public health uh, issue obesity, which is fed by the diets. Right? Absolutely, it's a direct result of of, of our capitalist <laughs> uh, Western diet. No question about so it. So, do you feel that you connect with the kids? I love our kids. Yeah, uh, it's great. Yeah, do they come back? Ideally, we like to have them for. Uh, oh, close to eight visits and Ooh. in those programs we try to get one or two with a caregiver or a parent because it's one thing to inspire a child but they right. go home and it's the I same see. old fast food or McDonald's right. or or whatever um, so getting parents involved. but the interesting thing is I, I know we have a lot of preconceived notions about these families and just eating you know yeah, horrible bad cheap right. bad food uh, but a lot of them are multi-generational families where there's a grandparent who does cook from scratch and does oh, connect so to some very different ingredients. Right. Isn't that it? That's interesting. It's, it's, it? It's, it inspires us in yeah. turn, yeah. Have you uh, been, are you down at the White House at all? Are you involved in some kind of programs with uh, Michelle Obama's garden and her old? We're not, and we would love to be, so if, if she's watching you, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, our bags are packed. Right. It's interesting. You must have been delighted when she started, right? I, it really, it helps. It helps yeah. us because it puts, it, it sort of legitimizes what, what we've been, been doing saying. for, yeah. what, like four or five years now. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a huge movement. I mean, people, the school lunch movement, looking at what we're feeding our kids, all on federal and state dollars, we're feeding them. You know, Are you involved in in the school food? Just tangentially. What it's you know you can really get lost right. in it. So we really focus on the things that are most important to us. One is the hunger issue, huge. Right. You know when you're feeding thousands thousands of people a day, the fact that anybody should go hungry in New know, York is just, just it's, incredible. It's mind boggling. Mind boggling. With with all the with the kinds of the food you're serving and the kind of events that you're catering. And then you know that people are standing in line at a pantry. It's, right. It must be incredible. So we put our energy there, and then we put our energy into working with children, uh, just building those experiences and, and influencing their lives. Uh, getting involved in the schools, like, again, we have friends and we support the work, wellness in schools and, mm. and so many other programs. Um, Is there somebody that coordinates people who feel like you and are doing things like you? 
in the city? No, but it will happen right now. It's such a grassroots organization. Mm -hmm. I, probably, I guess like every week or two, there must be someone who wakes up and thinks they've just discovered this movement. Right. Uh, <laughs> like about a month ago, I was talking with someone very well known in the restaurant business, and I asked him what's going on, what do you see as a trend, thinking, from my perspective, okay, what comes after everybody's right. sick and tired of hearing right. about green? And he looks at me and he says, well, you know, it's all about eating local. <laughs> like he just discovered it. I said, okay. <laughs> Very good. Sounds interesting. I remember in the um, 70s, I worked for the Port Authority, and w they owned that, all that land in Red Hook along the water. But, they, but also, when I went there and went through Brooklyn, it just I, I couldn't understand why we weren't growing vegetables <laughs> in the city. And of course, everybody said, well, you can't do it. The soil, the this, the that. But you know, it's the old thing, if you can do magic things like going to the moon, you certainly can do something here. So that's finally taking root. Well, it started. Urban farming. Yeah, urban and in farming. Red Hook in particular, the yeah. added value farm. Yeah. They just started farming Smart. on top of a blacktop. Isn't you know, added a couple of feet of, uh, of topsoil and, and they're growing. It's at so, least an acre farm. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's really a, a great thing. So you, are, you have this collaborative spirit. You also can delegate. That's an important thing, right? To be able to delegate responsibility things. <laughs> it's an ongoing battle. Why? Because Are you afraid when you do it? No, I'm not afraid, but I just, you know, we're highly branded. Uh, <laughs> there are things I have in my head that are so specific. Um, but I, it's, it's, it's an ongoing form of self-discipline. Who cooks at your house? Me. You do? Yep. And do you, uh, every day? No. I, I don't know why those <laughs> kids have to eat every day. Uh, but on the weekend, I'll get into the kitchen. It's, it's therapeutic, yeah. so that, that's my therapy. And during the week? Uh, during the week, they'll have a lot of salads. Do you uh, bring food home? I, I don't. I don't. No, so I've got one off in college, and, and she's eating very healthfully up at Bates. So oh, that's great. That's very nice. Uh -huh. uh, my son will eat anything meat, so he's, he's pretty Kachi easy. Kachi Farm is named after him. It is. That's, what does it mean? Well, some people I'd say that Kachki is an old Indian tribe. Right. It sounds right. like it. Um, but it's really Yiddish, uh -huh. and it means duck. And when Sam was born, uh, for, he doesn't look like a duck. He's extremely handsome, <laughs> uh, but it's just a term of endearment. Uh, and I called him Kachki. Uh, and I told him that one day uh, we have a little cafe that I named for his younger sister, and that's the Mei Mei Cafe. And I said that he was next in the next May -may. part. Is that a M A M I E? M A E M A E. M A E. That's great. And that was Sylvia's nickname. Yeah. And of course, somebody told me once that Mei Mei in Chinese means littlest sister. <laughs> which, which she was. So. Uh, and Syl we didn't talk about Sylvia, but this partly all your, your farm and stuff was, uh, came out of your spiritual thinkings, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the farm was a dream for, for many, many years. Um, but when Sylvia died, uh, you know, I come from a, the, the, the core of my, my world in catering has always been about uh, details and obsessing about colors and shapes and sizes. And, and you go through an experience of, of losing a child and you think, am I ever going to be able to hear a client complain right. that something was like a little too cold right. or a little too hot? So I decided in order to come back into this uh, world that I would, and, and with my husband's support and encouragement, uh, we'd buy the farm. And on the farm, we would start the Sylvia Center. Sylvia wanted to be a helpful human. Uh -huh. And she loved farms, because I, I was a CSA junkie uh, <laughs> before I became a farmer. And she would come with me every week. We'd get the eggs, we'd walk the fields, she'd pick fruits and vegetables. And it just seemed, uh -huh. um, a farm is a very healing place. Yeah. Uh, and the land. Oh, I, I, I sometimes a, a rabbit runs across the property, and I know it's her. <laughs> That's so lovely. So I am so delighted to have talked with you and t and s admire this whole operation and wish that uh, other people ran businesses this way and had the conscience and the spirit and everything else that goes into it. It's really quite remarkable. <laughs> well, you, you make it sound fabulous. And you are very so modest. Thank you. Well, <laughs> 
You're welcome to come to the farm for our spring yeah. cleanup. And you do you do public events at the mm -hmm. farm. I'm, mm -hmm. I get it on the internet. The other thing I wanted to talk about before we end is that you write a blog on Huffington Post. I do, every Monday. Every Monday, which is really interesting. You do the catering at the plaza, yep. right? And you were pretty pissed off when they criticized the plaza and said it was failing. Well, they could criticize the landlord if they want. There's certain political real estate issues, yeah. but it's just like everything else. Yeah. Uh, we have hundreds of families we're supporting there. Yeah. So your blog is what? Uh, well, it's under Huffington Post. Uh, the Huffington Post, Liz Newmark. On Monday. Uh, and you talk Monday. about everything. Today, like, this week was tennis. <laughs> Last week, I don't even remember what it was. Who knows what it'll be next week. <laughs> well, thank you, Liz. And thank you, Ronnie. Lots of good luck. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.